Welcome everyone, it's the Crypto Lark, and today I am joined by Camilla Russo, a former Bloomberg journalist who is now writing a book on Ethereum with Harper Collins. Camilla, how's it going? It's going great, Lark. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Now, today we're going to be talking about Ethereum and really why decentralized finance is shaping up to be an unstoppable force in the cryptocurrency industry. And by the way, in addition to the book that Camilla is currently authoring, she also has a newsletter called The Defiant, which keeps you up to date on all of the latest happenings in Ethereum. So there is a link down below in the description to the newsletter and to Camilla's Twitter, where you can follow along and get more information about the book and about the newsletter as well. So Camilla, let's get started off with why Ethereum? What interests you so much about what's going on with Ethereum? Yeah, so I guess what got me interested in writing a book on Ethereum was um, covering crypto in 2017 with Bloomberg News. Uh, by the end of 2017, I saw this amazing, crazy thing that had happened with the with the ICO bubble then. And I thought, you know, there's a story to be, there's a book in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I thought Ethereum was probably the most interesting story to tell. Uh, you know, for me, just looking at the space, Ethereum seemed like it was the next big thing after Bitcoin. Like, it seems like it it took blockchain technology forward. Um, like, Bitcoin is great at doing one thing, which is exchanging value from A to B. But Ethereum seemed to really open up the possibilities of what can be done with digital money. So I thought that was really interesting and had and the, like the story of Ethereum really hadn't been told. So I was super excited to be the first to tell it. Nice. <laughs> now, Ethereum back in 2017 was very interesting. We saw all these ICOs and things. And then very quickly, we saw the Ethereum network start to get too busy, right? We had too many transactions mm -hmm. that couldn't handle it. And so we're, we're going through now this, this multi-year progress of upgrading ethereum are you worried about the progress of ethereum do you think it's not going fast enough do you think they'll be able to upgrade in time to remain relevant well um i'm not worried i think it's been slow and a little bit tumultuous because what they're trying to do is not compromise as much as other smart contract platforms are like they really do want to stay decentralized and have scalability and that's a very tough uh, problem to solve so i think that's why it's taken so long but i think they're on track um to launch a uh, phase phase zero of ethereum 2.0 in january um you know i think it was last week when seven clients became interoperable for for uh, this proof of stake chain so that was huge progress and it seems like they'll be able to to make it to to launch uh phase zero in in january in the meantime of course there's other layer two solutions that um de developers can can use e either live or in the works like there's so much research and development going on in this space um and so on the other hand, while this is all happening, it doesn't seem like Ethereum dApps actually, you know, require that much scaling at mm -hmm. the like, um, stage they're at now. Like they, you know, daily users aren't very high, um, transactions per second. I mean, they they don't need that much more maybe that, that what's currently available. So I think what most people in Ethereum are hoping is that both dApps and the chain can kind of grow together. It's like as dApps need more scalability, the solutions will be there. So, and, and I think that's kind of playing out so far. Yeah, we certainly see a lot of the current applications on Ethereum really not requiring that massive uh, transactional throughput. We have things like uh, non-fungible tokens, right? And once you have the non-fungible token, you, it sits in your blockchain wallet mostly and you don't need to send it back and forth or interact with it in a way that uh, causes you to clog up the network. You can just access the token, for example, or if you're using IDEX, you're probably not doing 10,000 trades a day. You might just be doing two or three trades a day on IDEX. And if you're using right. MakerDAO, well, you don't, you're probably not doing a collateralized debt position 20 times a day. You might do it once a month or once a year. Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference there. Um, the question for you, is Ethereum 
money? This is a pretty hot question right now with people saying, well, only Bitcoin can be considered, you know, as, as a money. So do you think <laughs> is Ethereum money? Well, um, I don't like, I don't really, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that Ethereum is money. I mean, that ETH is money and not sure why it's even up for debate. Like I'm, I don't even know why it's a controversial topic. <laughs> <laughs> and it means, like it's a means of exchange that can be used to buy and sell goods and services. And that's a fact, you know? So, you know, um, I mean, some people might not want to use it as money, but in, it is in fact being used as money. There are companies, um, very few to be sure, but some companies do pay their employees in, in ETH. Um, Big Pay announced, I, I think it was yesterday or, or very recently, that it's adding Ether um, as, you know, uh, to it's, it's accepting Ether for, for payment. Uh, so it's to me, it's a fact that, that it's money. We can like discuss whether it's good money or bad money or, you know, how it can be better. Um, and it's also a deserve a reserve currency for decentralized finance. You know, it's yeah. used to to back uh, DAI, which is a more stable form of, of money. So, yeah, there's just like too much concrete evidence to say otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> no, do, you, do you have uh, an opinion on whether it is good or bad money? Um, I don't think it's great money. Um, I think it can be used to you know, to buy and, and sell stuff. Um, but I don't think it's the best uh, means of exchange. I think it's, it's great uh, that it can be serve as collateral for a better money, which is DAI, in my opinion. Mm, interesting. Now, Vitalik recently said that uh, he was talking about the decentralized finance ecosystem. He said they're new, they're untested. They uh, do have a risk of breaking, and we should not be encouraging people to invest their money in these things, talking about all the decentralized finance applications. What are your thoughts on his comments? Yeah, well, I completely agree with Vitalik. I think the DeFi ecosystem is barely a year old, so it's you know very new, very cutting-edge tech. A lot of these platforms and the tech they're using hasn't been uh, tested. Um, they're just trying these things out. It's very experimental. So definitely, uh, I think people shouldn't be putting in large amounts of money in, in these platforms. I think they're super risky. Um, but I do encourage, I mean, I would encourage anyone to test them out and use, you know, something that they're willing to lose and see how these things work. Because, you know, what they're coming up with and the experience is just like, I, I, I would call it, uh, magical like it's very interesting what you can do in these platforms and i think anyone who's interested in crypto should be trying them out yeah some of this stuff is absolutely revolutionary we're, we're going to get to talking about a, a couple of those in sp specifically but i think that's just great advice in general don't put in more than you can afford to lose you know maker dow and all this stuff this is great but what we're, we're doing we're essentially looking at technology which is incredibly new and mm -hmm. there are risks that something might break at some point. I mean, I know they're being very rigorous with their code testing and all this stuff, but things do happen. Things do mm -hmm. happen. So that's worth uh, keeping in mind. Now, in terms of driving value for the Ethereum ecosystem, right now we're seeing Ethereum's total daily gas use is at an all-time high, which is mm -hmm. very interesting. But also the total fees are inching kind of up more towards on the level with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this kind of new economic situation, I mean, I know the chain's getting busier as well, so there's there's that to consider. And when we have ETH 2.0 at some point in the future, those fees will probably go down. But do you think that the, the fees market is kind of finding a new purpose for Ethereum here in that kind of post-ICO boom? Or do you think it's really all about, you know, trying to just get Ethereum to the next stage and not worrying so much about the, the fees and driving value for Ethereum with that? Um, no, I think the focus should still be on, on the current chain. I think, you know, despite phase zero coming up next year, it will be a while before uh, the full Ethereum 2.0 is like functioning. So I don't think people should stop paying attention or caring for ETH1 continue to, to work. 
So I think it's it's important to see how these uh, dynamics play out. I think it's it's bullish for Ethereum, obviously, that um, gas uh, usage is increasing, and it's also bullish that uh, transaction fees are increasing. But it's also, you know, um, it's it might be a little bit concerning if that makes uh, use harder down down the line. Um, so it's something to watch, but it definitely shows that people are using uh, Ethereum and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, and it's getting legitimate activity, unlike I would argue in during the ICO days, which was, you know, maybe a, a percentage of ICOs were actual teams raising money. A lot of it was just scams and that was, you know, making acti activity go up, I think. Um, what we're seeing today in the Ethereum ecosystem is so much healthier than mm. 2019. I mean, all of DeFi, its projects actually delivering uh, products are not, you know, raising money just to, you know, raising $300 million with, with nothing on a white paper. They're like, you know, these products are actually um, live and delivering value for, for users. So um, it's so much more mature and, and, and healthier. Um, and then obviously uh, you can't talk about uh, uh, rising fees without talking about the Ethereum version of Tether, which is the cause of you know all, all this activity. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's like different ways to look at it. I, I don't think Tether is necessarily the coin you'd want to kind of associate your team with, <laughs> or it's, I don't think it's something to be proud of, you know? Um, but it does seem to kind of, you know, like there's a reason why it's, it's getting almost, you know, it's almost beating uh, Bitcoin in like a number of metrics. And, you know, that's because Ethereum has proven to be a secure blockchain over, you know, four years mm -hmm. of life and like multiple attacks. Um, and it's just also faster than Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, it's, you can go different tether, but at least it signals, you know, Ethereum is, uh, useful for like transactions. <laughs> yeah. And it, there's also, of course, it's tether is the big one. And obviously tether has got the biggest market cap and the biggest yeah. trading volume and the, and the biggest, uh, tr on chain transaction value in terms of moving from one address to another. But we also have all these uh, stablecoin competitors, whether we're talking about mm -hmm. DAI or USDC or Paxos or any of the other, you know, list of different uh, cryptos that are stablecoins, and they're all existing on Ethereum, right? Mm -hmm. They've some of them are branched out, you can find uh, uh, Tether on Tron these days, for example, but in general, most of this has found its home on Ethereum, which I think says a lot about the robustness of the Ethereum ecosystem overall and you actually brought up one interesting thing too i wanted to follow up on about the the yeah. post ico boom you had all these teams that raised all this money right and failed to deliver projects and failed to deliver tech missed deadlines etc 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 and and that i think a lot of people tend they spend so much time focusing on that that they forget about like all the really good projects that actually raised money and then like we had for example bancor recently i think they they basically they had so much ethereum left over and they're like well we're not really doing anything with this so they ended up uh didn't they end up airdropping a whole bunch of it or all of it that they had left or something like that to bancor yeah, to yeah, network yeah. token holders yeah, exactly. No, they're 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 planning to. Um, so I mean, yeah, that's one team uh, that did an ICO, and and you know it was pretty controversial the ICO they did, but you see them two years later, you know, still building. Um, they're one of the like big components of DeFi. Um, so there's like definitely one like positive example of of ICOs. Uh, Kyber is another one. I mean, I think it's like one of the. Uh, Dexes with the most volume. They also did an, an ICO. So, yeah, I think ICOs got such a bad name, but some good did come come out of them for sure. That's right. So some teams actually took their fundraises seriously, and it's it's. I think the the bad ones gave the good ones uh, a bad name, unfortunately. Yeah. And people just focused on the the bad stuff, and not about all the good stuff that was built. We got a, a lot of amazing technology that was built in the last two years. Thanks in part to the 2017 ICO boom. So there's definitely that. Now, what is your favorite use case for decentralized finance? Um, so I think uh, like thinking a, a specific use case for me would have to be uh, gaining interest. Uh, you know, the ability to just, you know, start 
earning dollar-based interest in a couple of clicks is really compelling. It's just very simple and it's something that everyone can use wherever they are and that anyone can understand like, okay, I have, I have funds. I'm, if they're sitting in my bank account, I want to make some return. If you're in a developed nation, that's going to be near zero or even negative in some, in some places. Mm -hmm. So being able to really get double digit returns from your laptop like you don't even need to you know go to like a bank a branch or like speak to an executive or anything in many cases like no kyc just like go in and start gaining interest that's like i mean i think that's that if there's one thing that can take uh, DeFi to the mainstream i think that's it um because like i said it's something that everyone will find a use for um, but just more broadly, I think what's very so interesting um, to me about DeFi is just the potential potential to have a more inclusive financial system. Um, and that includes interest rates, but it also includes uh, borrowing and issuing and trading and you know whatever you can do in the traditional financial system, but more because there will, will be new use cases that we haven't thought of um, and things that you can't do in, in the traditional finance and and anyone will be able to participate so you don't you know you don't have to be uh, based in the US and have a bank account to uh, trade uh, Tesla stock now you can you know be a 15 year old guy from Chile you mm -hmm. know who's in tech and you know want some exposure to his favorite brand he can do it through a synthetic asset uh, in, you know, on DeFi. Um, so it's just like creating a, a different financial system um, with fewer intermediaries, lower fees, and that anyone can access. And I think that's so exciting about DeFi. <laughs> it's incredibly exciting when you start to realize the potential, when you start to realize how many billions of people have been excluded from that system based on arbitrary things like where they were born, right? They, that doesn't need to be the future of the world of finance. Everyone can have the ability to make themselves, you know, a uh, wealthy over time or, yeah. you know, ensure their financial destiny is in their hands, not in the hands of their irresponsible central banks, which collapse currencies left, right and center all over the world. And it's, yeah, it's totally crazy. I think the interest rate thing is really interesting because I feel like there's this like, I don't know, weird post-traumatic stress syndrome or something happening with like regular people because the banking system is so screwed up right now. People are getting like 0.1 or 0.2% interest or something. I mean, in New Zealand, we've got good interest rates. I think it's around mm -hmm. like two and a half, three percent or something like that, yeah. which is pathetically low. And people mm -hmm. have got so used to the banks screwing them that they've actually forgot that the banks give you 0.1% on your money, but they're lending your money out at like 20%, 25%. And they're, they're making 20, 19.9% uh, off of your money that they gave you gave them. And so when you look at the decentralized finance rates and you're getting, let's say 10% on your USDC or 12% on your die or whatever it might be. Those rates and some people are like, well, that's, that's too much. That's not possible. Like, no, it is possible. You're, you're cutting out the middleman who was taking all the money before. And that's why you can get some of these great rates on some of these, yeah. these services. I mean, to be sure it, it is so high because yeah, you're, you're, you're cutting out like inefficiencies, but it's also a, a reflection of risk. Like yeah. you, we were saying before, like that's, something you should always keep in mind like there's no free lunch like if, if interest rates are so high it's because it's risky and you know that's the amount that you know you're getting paid to take on that risk but you know for some people it's worth it uh for some people it's worth one percent of their money uh to be in in those risky platforms if, mm -hmm. if they're getting one percent um yeah and, and I, th I think that's 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 amazing that that, that it can be done and you know, going forward, we'll see more liquidity in DeFi, and that'll bring probably bring down rates. 
but it'll be, you know, with, with the benefit of having a more secure and more liquid system. So I think that's how it'll, we'll see it evolve. Yeah, for, for those people who come in early and are willing to take those risks, they get uh, the higher rewards, you know, because exactly. they are taking a risk. And actually, I saw it was um, to move into a few of the specific projects mm -hmm. I want to talk about. Uh, compound finance, for example, obviously, there are risk factors based there. But I saw that Coinbase, I think Coinbase put $2 million worth of USDC into uh, compound finance recently. Just I think that was more than anything for them just to say, like, it's safe. We're, I mean, if Coinbase loses $2 million, they, they won't even, you know, they'd probably make that every single day. So it won't be a big loss for them. But still, I think that that really shows that they're putting some faith into that ecosystem. So what are some of the risk factors that are, you know, around something like compound finance? Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, for uh, about uh, Coinbase, I think it was 2 million USDC split between Compound and another project that I'm blanking right. out on now. I'm, I can't remember. Maybe it was, no, I, I don't remember. It was Compound or something else. So it was, yeah, 1 million in Compound, 1 million, um, which is great. You know, it's it's their, like, new DeFi fund, but it's, it's still, like, pretty low compared to, like, overall, like, lending mm. volume. Yeah, for sure, it, it's a sign that Coinbase is kind of putting their reputation in, in this and saying, hey, like, this is something that's cool and <laughs> we're trying it out. Um, so about um, the risk in in Compound and um, many other, other of these platforms, I think there are many risks. Uh, the main one with smart contracts is that, you know, smart contracts can uh, fail. They can be uh, hacked into, <laughs> um, you know, they they can, you know, people can exploit a loophole, like uh, what we saw with the DAO hack, mm -hmm. uh, or they can, they can just like not, you know, they, people can shut them down, like with the, the parity multisig hack, like we've seen it before um, with contracts holding lots of money and it can happen in DeFi for sure. I'm actually a little bit surprised it hasn't happened yet. Like I think the, the probability of uh, a, a uh, contract holding a lot of money being hacked in DeFi is pretty high, just because it's such a new uh, system, and like like we said, like all this tech is so cutting edge and untested that it just like would make sense that it it should get hacked at some point, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I think you know that's that's one one big risk, and then the other one is just you know just how decentralized these uh, systems and platforms are. So there's obviously um, a spectrum of decentralization mm -hmm. and some some projects might be more on the centralized side than their users assume that they are and it was one of the risks that i you know compound was audited recently and the auditors highlighted this that uh compound management team actually has a lot of control over over the system so this is something to keep in mind. I mean, you, you're going into a DeFi platform assuming that you're in full control, but actually, you know, the team running behind this, this platform can change the rules on you. Um, and so that's something to be aware. I think it's, um, it's natural uh, for developers and, uh, and, and the, the people leading these teams to, to want that type of control because these projects are so early, so they mm. want to be able to, uh, you know, iterate and fix things as, as they come along. And if, uh, like, if the project is completely decentralized, it will be really hard to do. So I think it's also in the benefit of users that they keep some control. But I think users should be aware of this risk. So um, and you know, and decide you know how much money they want to put in 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 these platforms accordingly. And also really important is these teams being completely upfront with how much control they have. Yeah. So. yeah, that's definitely not always transparent about how much control the teams actually have. And I think that's kind of one of the things that happen in the background. A lot of people, they just come in, they see the rates, they they do the thing, and it's not written on the side of it. By the way, we can change rules at any time on you, so you should keep that in mind. One interesting yeah. thing, too, that I've seen is um, something called, I think it was Nexus uh, Mutual. So this is a platform to protect against smart contract failure. So it's like a smart contract failure insurance fund, which... Mm -hmm. I thought was pretty gosh darn interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. And I think that insurance more broadly, as we start to 
really roll out these decentralized finance use cases is probably going to become a pretty big thing. What are your thoughts on insurance yeah. as part of the decentralized finance movement? Well, I think insurance is definitely crucial for, for DeFi um, because of what we've been talking about of how, how risky it is and how smart contracts can be hacked or fail. I think the, you know, if, if people can easily insure their, their money and if uh, platform, platforms themselves can insure users' money, I think that will be a, a big step forward. I think Nexus is, is a great uh, project. Um, the problem is it's still small. I think it, it's holding about um, 10,000 ETH or like, which is like uh, like $2 million uh, in its liquidity pool, which kind of limits the mm -hmm. amount of funds it can secure. So yeah, like it's useful, but to some extent. To an extent, um, yeah. So, but you know, it's just like, because it, like when was it launched? Like, I don't know if it was launched over like a month ago or like i don't know two months at the most still relatively so, new yeah yeah so i think as we go forward it will continue to gain liquidity we'll see other insurance uh services and um yeah th this this specifically specific sector in DeFi needs to continue growing and i think it will nice now we've seen um I guess in terms of risk and all that kind of stuff or kind of fits in the conversation, we've seen like MakerDAO, for example, we've seen mm -hmm. like their rates change so much. It's it's actually kind of crazy. You look one day and it's 19.5%. You look next day, it's 12.5%. It's just, it's up and down, up and down, up and down. Do you think that's, that? do you think that's good, I guess, for the, the faith of people in these, um, these platforms to be able to actually manage what they're doing and do you think the rates are changing too much do you think it's too arbitrary for example um yeah i think about maker i think it's a fascinating system and a fascinating experiment on governance and i think the measure of it's of whether you know it's been successful successful or not is you know watching the die peg which I think it's been largely successful um, recently. At least this year, um, the peg hasn't deviated that much from from one dollar. Uh, so I think you know that that kind of answers whether they they've been successful or, or not. Um, and I think it's just so interesting that it's MKR holders the ones making the the decisions. Um, so I don't think it's arbitrary because. It is a predefined process, you know, every week they vote mm -hmm. on on the rate and everyone has, you know, a uh, vote according to how much maker they're, they're, they're putting in. So, you know, it's it's based on, on rules and, you know, people know what to expect. Um, and I just think it's, it's amazing that, you know, these loose group of token holders have been able to enact monetary policy so that Dai has been able to stay in their one in its one dollar peg pretty pretty closely. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, about it, like yeah, like changing so much. Uh, it's been crazy. Like like at the end of August, it was at twenty point five percent, and now it's at twelve point five percent. So yeah, it's gone. It's declined like <laughs> like eight percentage points in like a, a few weeks. Um, but you know that's that has uh, kept its its peg, which is great. On the other hand, like lenders who were hoping to get twenty percent interest are now getting uh, twelve percent. So that's that's not good for for those users. Borrowers, it's it's good for them because they're able to get um, cheaper loans. So you know there's there's two sides to that. I think as the as the like ecosystem matures will have more sophisticated instruments to protect against um, rate volatility like in the future we'll probably see uh, f uh, futures <laughs> and mm -hmm. swaps to to hedge against against those moves but yeah it's still too early and so yeah we we, we see this um, these huge moves well it's like you said it's 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 a fascinating experiment in, in governance you know because you do have the token yeah. holders who are the ones who are deciding what the rates are going to be and that's that's just it's great actually in, in yeah. a lot of ways it's not some 
you know, central bank somewhere where they everything's totally non-transparent. Like it's actually all very transparent, and it's the the token holders who are the ones who are deciding it. So if you want to partake in that system, we'll get some tokens, and your voice can be heard too. And I think that's actually pretty cool. You can actually buy yeah. into the governance if you want to be part of the MakerDAO governance. That's open to you. It's available to you. And that's pretty cool when it comes down to it. Now I've yeah. just got a, a couple more questions here for you before we finish up today. What are your thoughts on wrapped Bitcoin? So wrapped Bitcoin, for anyone who doesn't know, this is when basically they lock up X amount of Bitcoin and they issue out uh, Bitcoin based Ethereum tokens. So an Ethereum token that represents Bitcoin. What are your thoughts on wrapped Bitcoin? Um, I think it's so interesting. And I think, you know, I think it's great for, for DeFi to get that amount of liquidity in the ecosystem and i think it's great for bitcoin holders to be able to um you know not let go of their bitcoin exposure and still participate in in, in all these uh, platforms so i think that's great um i think the most popular solution now which is wbtc isn't so great because you it's it's not like you're you have bitcoin and you just go and wrap it and get an Ethereum token. Um, you can't do that right now. So the only way to get WBTC is through an exchange. So it's not like so direct. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's something to improve. I think it'd be great to have a more decentralized, seamless way for Bitcoin holders to get um, Ethereum based um, Bitcoin, but I know that teams are working on that. Like there's um, this project called Soda, uh, which offers Bitcoin backed DAI loans. And I, I'm sure there's a couple more working on this. So yeah, I think that's that's one improvement we'll we'll see in the future, getting Bitcoin on, on Ethereum and DeFi. That's right. It's, 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 you can't ignore Bitcoin. It's such a massive part of the entire crypto economy. So bringing that in to the Ethereum ecosystem is actually a very clever move and I think will be very big moving forward as well. Now, the final question, yeah. uh, or I guess topic here for us to discuss today is we saw recently a, a big story. We've seen actually a lot of, I guess, big financial institutions preferring Ethereum over a lot of the uh, competitor crypto um, blockchains. But we've seen Santander Bank recently, for example, issue a $20 million bond um, and then I think buy their own bond back. They were just kind of running this as an experiment sort of thing. but. Why is this such an important story? I think this is actually a pretty big story. It didn't get probably enough press because it's like, oh, bonds and all that stuff. But what do you what do you think about this? Um, yeah, I think it's a it's a big story because you know it's pretty telling that one of the world's biggest banks. I mean, Santander is uh, it's I don't know. I think it was I, I looked it up. It was like number like fourteen in the world by by assets. So it's a it's a huge bank with thousands of clients everywhere and they're testing out blockchain technology uh, specifically on Ethereum um, to see whether they can uh, settle and tokenize securities and and it looks like it was a successful experiment if they actually saw value in in doing this they'll pro probably you know communicate this to their thousands of corporate and institutional clients mm -hmm. So if, if that happens, then we might, you know, it, it might be a driver for more institutions to start using um, blockchain technology to issue and exchange and settle uh, securities, which which is great. Um, and yeah, I think in, in this specific case, blockchain tech uh, does make sense. I think there are many, many more cases where using it in like a private ecosystem blockchain doesn't make sense and it's, it's more inefficient, but there there are uh, good use cases for, for sure. And I think we're, we'll probably like head into a future where uh, blockchain technology will start to permeate uh, traditional finance in these use cases where it's actually useful. And, and then we'll also see uh, decentralized finance and or like open finance, whatever you want, you mm -hmm. want to call it. Um, compete with finance with traditional finance too so we'll start seeing kind of blockchain everywhere <laughs> yeah it's 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 coming it's coming and it's going to be yeah. really big and it we're actually i think the banks you know is, damn the banks but but really the banks the banks that get on early and i think start using these public networks they're the ones that are going to have the advantage we've seen some banks for example trying to build their own private permissioned networks to do their mm -hmm. those 
those will have their use cases for those banking um, cartels. But like really, when it comes down to the banks that are looking at using public open networks, I think they're the ones that are going to have the advantage in the future, not the guys who are trying to keep the power in their, their walled gardens. For sure. Yeah, definitely agree. Awesome. Awesome. Camilla, thank you so much for coming on today and telling us about decentralized finance and Ethereum and all that fun stuff. Again, for anyone who wants to check out the newsletter, The Defiant, there is a link down below where you can find more information on that. Camilla, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>